Uh, at first, I want to thank U.S. Poultry and Egg Association for the support of the research. Thanks, re thanks very much. And also, th this project was done at NC State, along with the effort from Dr. Robert Backstad, previous professor at NC State. So before I started, I want to give a brief introduction of what is black heart disease. Black heart disease, also called hemolysis, currently there's no treatment available for this disease. It is caused by the hemolysis malagridis, a common protozoan in avian species. The mortality in turkeys can be pretty high, anywhere from 15% to 85%. Sometimes we can see up to 100% mortality in a flock. However, this disease has very low mortality in chicken flock, but we do receive complaints from the broader breeder flock saying they have early mortality, especially during the first six weeks caused by this infection. On the contrary of this high pathogenity to turkeys, this parasite is actually very sensitive to the environment, such as the pH and the dry environment. It, it can die pretty quickly when the pH drops below four. And also we see the difference in virulence, different isolates from different outbreaks shows different pathogenity uh, in the lab trial. The clinical sign for the hemolysis, it is more obvious in the young birds, as you can see from the video. It shows typical sick birds clinical signs like hunched back, ruffle feather, droopy head, as you can see from the video and the pictures. And also you can see a very unique yellow dropping on the tail on the ground. When you necrops the dead birds, you will see some really interesting lesions in the cica. In the late stage, we will find this kind of cica core uh, inside the cica. Because this parasite will first colonize in the cica, then transfer through the portal system to the liver, where you see another type of lesion, uh, like this show on the screen. This lesion is called a bull-eye lesion, but in the reality, you may see all different kinds of lesions depends on the outbreak situation. So the first question we ask is, why it shows different mortality in chicken and turkeys. Of course, we cannot really compare everything between turkey, turkey and chicken. One of the perspectives we are trying to understand is how the immune response difference in chicken and turkey was it got infected with hemolysis. Well, uh, we have a lot of data on this part, but I cannot really present everything today. But I want to share some really interesting information, uh, information over here. Uh, here, this is a graph. We actually compare the MRA expression between the chicken and turkey after infected with hemolysis at uh, five or 10 days. From this graph, you, you can see that there's a much more genes being regulated in turkey compared to in chicken. We also dig into the pathways on the immune response, but in general, what we found is this parasite actually triggered uh, uh, Cytokine storm syndrome, which related to the dysregulated of immune response in turkeys compared to chicken. So that's one of the information we got, which possibly explained part of the reason why there's a high mortality in turkey compared to in chicken. Of course, more research needs to be done in this area. So in order to prevent or develop a strategy to treat this, this disease eventually, it is really important to learn the life cycle of this parasite which is actually a very fascinating story. I always enjoy telling the story of the uh, Hismonas maliagridis. So to start this story, we had to start with another parasite, which is called Hatterichus gallinarum, or cica worm. It is a worm widely exists in long-living chickens, especially for the organic production of fruit-wing chicken. So this worm has a two form, male and female, live in the cica. As I mentioned earlier, Chicken has a pretty good resistance to the black heart disease or hemolysis. So these worms in the seeker can mate with each other and produce the eggs. During this process, these eggs can be contaminated by the hemolysis maliagridis. And these eggs can be shed in the environment and persist in the environment for a long time. And this eggs actually is very, very resistant to any disinfected reagent. We tried so many different things. Only the high concentration bleach actually can kill this egg, but which is not really practical to use in the farm. 
And this side can be consumed by another vector, like earthworm, or consumed by the chicken again, just keep producing more and more contaminated eggs, and then increase uh, infection pressure in the environment. And this contaminated heterogeneous egg can be transferred through many different ways to a turkey born to initiate the outbreak. For example, shot equipment, or some uh, PPE that work out very, like boots. And also through some other vectors, the well-known one, uh, earthworm, grasshopper, or dark and beetles, to a turkey barn to initiate the whole outbreak. So actually, we're very interested to see how many vectors can actually carry this egg, contaminated with his monas, to a turkey barn and cause a problem. So we did something which is really interesting. We, we visited a lot of turkey farms, either with current outbreak or the outbreak history of his monasis, then we are doing hunting around the farm just to see whatever we can catch, catch around there and do a PCR testing to see if it's a positive for the heterogeneous eggs. And here what we found. Not to our surprise, we see repeatedly positive uh, results from the earthworm, darkling beetles, and grasshoppers. But to our surprise, we also see some new positives. Here are the list on the screen. We also see some negatives back as well. At first, I want to say this is a PCR test. It only tells you that the potential these vectors can carry the heterogeneous eggs, which can cause a problem. But we're not sure if they can carry the live heterogeneous to a turkey barn yet. But again, as you can see, that the more vectors can potentially carry this egg to a turkey barn cause a problem, which is a great challenge to us, but also tell us that the opportunity is over there. The pest control could be very important for the preventing the outbreak of this disease, which we see the successful examples in the field when they level up the pest control, which they can cut off the outbreak cycle. So let's back to this story. So once the birds consume these contaminated vectors, it's initiated the outbreak. However, the high mortality we can see from turkey barn is not really result from all the birds consume these vectors or eggs at one time. It's result from the transmission. The transmission of this parasite is actually very interesting. As I mentioned earlier, it is very sensitive to the low pH. So in that case, think about the geyser and preventriculars of the birds. It's very acid. So the researcher believe this disease cannot transmit it through the oral garbage because of acid environment. So it missed through another way, which is called clinical drinking. Basically, it's direct or indirect contact of cloaca on the feces of the other sick birds to cause this transmission. However, we talk about the theory, but we have never have videos or any pictures actually showing this kind of behavior, which should cause transmission. But through another trial that we date, on the early disease detection, we have this video, which is very interesting. If, if, if you notice that, that's one bird on the upper uh, right corner, as you can see over there, sitting over there, that was a sick bird infected with uh, his monas. And you can see how the interaction between that bird with the other birds. A lot of a contact, and these birds are kind of trying to bully these birds. You will see these birds will die in a couple of minutes. Look at this. The other birds are trying to mount on this birds. So we believe during this process, there may be some increased contact between the house and that birds. This is a research sighting. You can pick up the data pretty quick. But think about a huge turkey barn. Can the manager really pick up all the dead birds at on time? We see this footage, but we're not sure how big a role it's played in the management. But the one thing we want to say is like, picking up the dead on time could possibly help you to reduce the situation of the outbreak. So it is very important. Well, we also want to think out of the box. You probably know the coxie, right? It's really common for the zone. His monas is also for the zone. Why is the transmission so unique? Can this protozoan be transmitted or infected through a different way? So one of the master students, Catherine Fudge, did a really excellent job on this part. We are trying to explore a different way for the infection, which is through the oral fecal pathway. So in the past, this is not very successful. The reason behind that, one of the reasons probably is the researcher only changed the birds with a pure culture with his monocyte. That's no other protection. But in the production, the birds constantly pick up the 
feces contaminates one on the ground. So these parasites actually some, have some type of protection from these fecal content. So what we do actually, we mix with the culture with the fecal content and repeatedly invite the birds through our pathway. So by the end of the day, we can produce 43 to 90% of the infection rate by doing this, which shows that the possibility this transmission could through this pathway. Again, this brings more challenge to the producers and researchers saying, wow, we have another way to transmit the parasites. What do we can do now? But again, every challenge comes with opportunity. In this case, litter management, amendment, litter eating behavior, and the control in the upper intestinal tract is all can become a potential opportunities for everyone to figure out the new strategies to control the transmission. And again, the transmission is the key to reduce mortality in a flock. No matter which way we are trying to understand about transmission, suddenly, during the whole project, we cannot produce this transmission model in our experimental setting. And also, we are trying to see if we make something, make something can part of the industry setting. So we create a lot of different stressors you can commonly see during the turkey production. It's all listed on the screen. But again, we still cannot induce this transmission in the lab settings. But we see something really interesting. Today, I'm going to show you part of data from this project. First thing, we're going to look at the direct infected birds, just to see how they react to these infections. We'll see some stressor, stressors, such as 18-hour fasting, or the imbalanced diet actually has an increased mortality for the direct infected birds, which is, means they facilitate this disease progression. Also, when you feed them with the low-protein diets, combined with COX infection, or again, 18 hours fasting, we also see an increase in mortality in, the, in these birds. These are done in the turkeys. In the broilers, similar story, we're also trying to reproduce different structures during the management. As you can see here, the daily restrict feeding, which have a 75 reduction compared to the skip a day, just to prove the concept you know, uh, of the trial, it also has increased liver scores, which is a means so it facilitates the disease progression. Along with that, the dewormer practice, uh, which we actually increase the dose a little bit compared to the recommendation to prove the concept, with the vaccination stress also have a, a higher liver scores over there. This can also become the stressors to facilitate this disease. So in summary, actually we see the low protein, fasting, or gut health related challenge make the situation worse. So think about it that can we reverse the situation by improving the nutrition, feed additives, or gut health promoter to make the situation better. So that's the one thing we did in the past, along with the effort from Dr. Baxter, that we tested so many different products on the market, which is available for either chicken or turkeys. Altogether, we tested 132 products from uh, 30, uh, 28 companies, altogether 196 trials. So we really want to understand if there's any potential category has a better impact on this disease. So we did a meta-analysis with a help from uh, Jin Kwan Wong from University of Georgia. And the majority of the trial is actually done by the Christina Sigman, the technician in the lab. So well, here, what we found. It is a big graph. I won't dive into it, but I want to show you something really interesting. If you look at this graph, you notice that the red line is popped up on the top. That belongs to the functional carbohydrate. It contains some prebiotics and the fermentation products. From this graph, basically it tells you this category has a higher potential to reduce mortality during the outbreak. But as, I, as you can see, the line is curved like this way. That means when the mortality or the outbreak situation become more severe, the ability to reduce the mortality decrease as well. It's the same for the other product as well. But this tells you this category has a more potential, maybe something we want to look into more. And also from the sick liver score, which high score means a more severe disease outbreak uh, disease situation. Besides the functional carbohydrate, you see the other category, and the plant extract could reduce the liver score as well. So even though we see different reductions of the these feed additives on the histomonasis, However, our goal is still to look for a therapeutic treatment for this disease. 
none of them actually can eliminate the parasites completely. And also you can see these products only function really well when the mortality is lower. So our goal is still to look for the therapeutic treatment. Well, at the last, to summarize my presentation today, at the first, we see more potential vectors can bring the Heterichus X, which is a vector for the Hesemonas, to a turkey barn. So the pest control is very important to prevent this disease, which is also being seen in the field that is successful. And also, the project is for a different way for the infection or potential transmission pathway in the field, which is also provide opportunity to us to look into the litter management or the litter eating behavior or the control in the upper GI tract. And also we see multiple stressors can play a role in increasing the, the disease progression. So the management or reduce the factors in the environment or in the diet is very important to reduce the loss from the disease. And at the last, very interesting, we see a lot of nutritional factors actually play a role in this disease. So nutrition could be matter in the disease control. I have a background in nutrition and disease, so I'm really interested looking into this topic, and I hope there's a more communication between the nutritionist and the vet in the field to you know, solve this problem, no matter if it's a nutritional disease issues. So this concludes my presentation, and I, I want to thank U.S. Portrait and Agri Association again for the support for this project, and also all the support from the producers providing materials and the support for the project. And this is uh, our previous lab member at NC State, and also the PI, uh, Dr. Backstad, Dr. Lee Walker, Dr. Frank Edens, and Dr. Jesse Grimes for the support for the whole trial, and I welcome to any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. So the first question is like um, this, this you know, area is still a challenge for the Turkey industry. And you're asking if there's a, any research project in the future work on this area. So um, actually at the University of Georgia, in the Georgia state, we don't have any turkeys. Uh, so we don't have a lot of materials actually doing the turkey project here. But I'm really, really interested in this area and really trying to you know, uh, helping the producers in this situation. So right now, the way how I work is more on extension side, trying to connect you with the resources. We have a lot of methodology, research model in the lab. If you're really interested in job in this area, don't hesitate to send me an email. I will share everything with you or help you to establish this research model or whatever happening right now to really bring the people in this research area. One thing I want to say is, there's a lot of opportunity in this area. Uh, I mean, the turkey industry really want, need the help in this area. Once you jump into it, you will figure out it's really fascinating. It's really interesting work in this area, and we will get a lot of support over there. Um, there's a several directions you may want to get into for this disease. We are looking to, you know, first genetic selection to find the resistant birds, or developing the vaccine for this field, or continue testing more feed additives which may work in different species on turkeys as well. So there's a many way you can actually uh, dive into this research. And the second question was, is there any nutritional intervention to control this disease from my perspective, right? So um, the things like we can see the nutrition play a role to control this disease, definitely, and in the future with, you know, the ban of a man, you know, the reduce the antibody in the production or other potentially uh, regulations to reduce the potential drug we can use in the industry. The method that we can use to control this disease is going to become less and less. Probably by the end of the day will be management or nutrition. So definitely nutrition is an important way to control this disease. Uh, one thing we are interested in looking into is how the diet formulation or certain nutrients can impact on this disease, which is uh, 
which is a really open area for everyone to explore. Definitely the interactions. You may get inspired idea from the Coxie field. And also, I remember the question you were asking, like how does functional carbohydrate actually play a role in this disease? One of the hypotheses we have, we don't really have a direct data to prove this, is the, uh, when the birds infect with these parasites, for example, the hismonitis, will cause the gut lesions. It may trigger some secondary infection like other optimistic bacteria or clostridium perfusions, some E. coli, especially for E. coli. These may contribute to the mortality. But these prebiotics or fermentation products may have a function to reduce these secondary infection, then keep the better you know, performance or less loss during the infection. Maybe that's one of the mechanisms that we have, but again, we don't really have a much data to prove that. But interaction between the bacteria and the parasite infection is also a really fascinating area to look into. Yeah. Thank you.